thing. <gasps> We're live! Everybody cheer! <laughs> you can see everyone's here. Um, <clears throat> and then I come over to here and I click this. I click this and I say share. And I present to everyone. And I'm screen sharing with everyone and I'm live. And that's awesome. All right. <clears throat> um, but I think that I want to switch back to this screen so you can see it. All right. Um, so, uh, my name's Matt G. All of you happen to know that. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview about internships, grad schools, and jobs. And uh, I'll start off by saying that I know that for myself, Talking about these kind of things has always been, you know, it raises the stress level. Because you're thinking about an unknown future, and you've heard stories about, and then what if, and oh no, and all right, so um, all of those things that you're afraid of are true. So, um, just <laughs> no, uh, all right, so, um, but, so part of the, an important part of the message is that really anything that you want to do, you can do. The trick is navigating the path that gets you there. So I'll give a brief overview. I'll talk a bit about internships and then jobs, grad school, and I believe when I made the slides, I forgot to talk about next steps. So that part will be short. Um, don't panic is your first most important message. It is, what, September 20th? <clears throat> We're thinking about internships maybe for the summer. Uh, if, and none of you are you're graduating, but you probably got a trajectory lined out. So, um, so none of us are worried about applying to grad school next year. That means if you're thinking about graduate work, you are you are well ahead of the game. <clears throat> I, in my senior year, applied to uh, let's see, I did an interview on campus, which two of my friends got and I didn't. And uh, by the way, I had the interview, but they got offers and I did not. Um, I then. Did, I applied to two grad schools. I got into one of them. And, uh, and actually, that was after requesting the application twice and never getting it. So I sent the materials that I believed constituted a grad school application. If I can do it, so can you. <laughs> there was nothing working in my favor. Um, and actually, I interviewed at Microsoft and I argued with uh, a project lead about what I thought they should be doing with Microsoft Word. Um, was pretty intense argument? I did not get an offer. <laughs> um, so really when you're looking at the future, you're looking at an intersection here between your dreams and reality. And so that isn't to say that you shouldn't aspire to your dreams, but I think the important thing is what we're trying to do is lay out the stepping stones in reality that get you there. Um, because Unfortunately, no one ever comes down and just says, Zach, we have created the perfect job for you. We knew you were graduating this coming May. And it's, it's everything you've ever dreamed of. And here are the keys to your new BMW. Like, it just doesn't work that way. Um, at least not for most of us. So, I don't have a Lamborghini. A Lamborghini, you know, they, they don't handle speed bumps. They just don't handle speed bumps. It's... But, they can live somewhere where there are no speed bumps. You're already destroying my dreams. <laughs> Maxie, <laughs> destroy your dreams. Thank you. Um, so the, the problem is, is that as we try and imagine what's next, and I don't know where I sold this image from on the web, um, but this is the picture we always imagine. That's what it's really like. And the difficult thing is, is when people tell stories about their past, it always comes out as the straight arrow. Um, one of my favorite talks that I ever heard was actually from a NASA astronaut. She told the story of how she became an astronaut. She was actually a marine biologist, and the grant she was being funded by was running out at the same time as applications for astronauts went up, and so she thought, well, why not? I've been underwater. How different is space? And she made it through the selection process, and then, you know, like, uh, but I mean, if you also think about it, somebody who worked deep under the ocean actually has pretty good qualifications for work in outer space. But she was very explicit that her story looked like this. It was opportunities that she took advantage of. 
and all, it's hard to predict those. So even though you may be charting a path, who knows what, where life will lead you from one step to the next. In terms of internships, I'm going to talk about four different pieces. Talk about identifying opportunities, uh, about networking, a little bit about building a portfolio, and also letters of recommendation. Uh, this talk is not endorsed or verified by anybody in our internships office, um, so I'll be leading you grossly astray. Um, I don't think I have. Um, but you know, I want to talk a little bit about identifying opportunities. And this is an intentionally busy slide. Um, and so I don't feel like I had already spoken with some of you who knew that games are an area of interest. Um, open source opportunities are an area of interest. So if I talk just a little bit about some of these, some of these all these all sort of fall in, fall in different categories of opportunity. And finding them is the tricky part. So for example, if you're interested in game development, you might say, does Blizzard Entertainment have an internship program? Yes, they do. Um, and if they do, you know, it's like, okay, so you go to the website and you look at what they ask for in terms of an application. What do I have to do? And there is a very clear way to apply. Um, there's got to be hundreds of game development countries in the US and many more around the world. So the other question that I would say is if you are interested in that kind of opportunity, what you do is you apply to Blizzard Entertainment and Electronic Arts because they are two big game companies. Your odds might look like one and two, but really your odds are one in however many people apply with respect to how many positions are available. And how many people do you think know about internships at Blizzard? How many people do you think want internships at Blizzard? You know, like, this is a large number. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, some strategies you might then start to take are, well, what's near my hometown? Are there any game development small indie studios near my hometown? Are there any small indie studios near Berea? Is there anybody doing game development up in Lexington? Cincinnati, Louisville, right? So starting to think in terms of related opportunities, geography, and so on, to broaden the pool of places that you start to think. So that's not just for game development, that's also for anything you might be interested in doing. Um, I say that in part, well, we'll get to that in a minute. So, so when you're interested in a category of opportunity, don't put your eggs all in one basket. So my story about only applying to two grad schools was because at graduation time, I swore I was done with school. And if I never saw another exam, it would be too soon. I had a marvelous summer. I had gotten into this grad program. I went back, and I started getting A's for the first time in my life and found something that I loved. So I couldn't have predicted that. I basically applied for to two grad programs on the premise that if they looked cool, I would apply. One was the Media Lab at MIT and the Hyper Instruments Research Group did not accept it. And one was a small analog robotics lab in Indiana. And I did get accepted into the master's program in Indiana and then transitioned to the PhD. Um, but I did not, I was just applying to a few things. And so it goes back to that notion of success being the squiggly line. I couldn't have predicted to for you that I would go where I did. Uh, if you're interested in open source type opportunities, there's a number of summer programs that run. Google Summer of Code is one of the largest. Google shells out cash to students around the world to work on projects, They're free and open source projects. Um, and actually, before you apply, the projects have to apply. So the projects put in an application to Google to be one of the projects that will get an intern. So it's not a guarantee, like, so the, I don't know if Apache is off in a project you know, or pick your open source product, Firefox, and so on. Um, but they actually apply to Google to be one of the pool, one of the projects that then students can then apply to work on. And if you get selected, Google throws cash at you to do open source software development with the project. Um, and so Google does that. Sometimes Mozilla does. I can't remember if Red Hat has a similar program project. Um, so there's a number of opportunities there. 
Uh, and also, sometimes those, there are opportunities that are specific either for minority groups or women. And so that's interesting. Um, but that's something that you can research. So that's a category of opportunities. Um, trickier to find are things like specific companies to large either internship or research programs. Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, thinking of some you know, really big names. Um, can't remember if joint is large. I should know that. The big, I don't know how big. Um, but IBM actually is a huge company and it maintains a number of research labs, as in pushing the boundaries of data storage, computation, um, RAM, right? Working on magneto-resistant RAMs so that you think about how your computer, when it's running, it goes to sleep. It takes a long time to go to sleep. That's because nowadays they often write the RAM to the hard drive. That means they're dumping four gigs, maybe. Okay, the machines. <coughs> Unfortunate last time. But two, four gigs of data gets dumped to the hard drive before the machine goes to sleep. If we had a RAM that didn't require power to maintain its state, it would mean that the machine would sleep like instantaneously. Close the lid instantly because the state of the RAM would be perfectly preserved. Flip the lid up, no power addition, breaks up. And so it's that kind of research that's going on in places like IBM and other large companies, um, as well as universities. So the point is, though, is that finding those kind of opportunities, and this is actually an actual, um, this was last year, and they'll probably, they probably run those every year. So even if they haven't announced a program for the coming year, when you find those opportunities, if you're interested in them, uh, it becomes a space to keep an eye on. Because I would be surprised if I did the same program in 2015. Now, Kroger, Amazon, Sunny D. It's like this, it's not orange juice. But their corporate headquarters is in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is two hours away. Uh, I can't, I'm pretty sure Kroger is based in Cincinnati. Um, Heister Yale is actually a subsidiary of NACO, or a branch of NACO, if you have the legal relationship. But they make forklifts, but NACO is actually a very large company in terms of materials and materials handling. They're, they're right here in Berea and are often looking for intern, intern students related to computing, networking, and so So, uh, Amazon, Lexington, they have a large distribution center as well as working group. They, so there's uh, there, there's product work that takes place for Amazon in Lexington. Right? I forget exactly what. By forgetting exactly what, I mean I've never known. However, we have an alum or two who work at Amazon and who worked up there have been back to campus recently. They've just recently moved to Seattle, some other shit. But um, we have good connections through to Amazon. And so I list those as examples of local places that it's easy to conceivably go and do an in-person interview. You can go and do an in-person. It is far more powerful than if you're applying to an internship on the West Coast and they say, well, can, can we do a, can you come and do an interview? You say, uh, are you flying me out? And you go, no. Maybe we'll do a phone interview. You go, because you're not going to sell as well on the phone as in person. Um, I don't know if that's true, actually. I find that it's much easier to present well in person than on the phone. Uh, Skype is like a halfway. I guess it's good because you can be nice and dressed up on top. <laughs> Just never have to stand up if you decide to do it in shorts or something. Um, so identifying opportunities is a matter of research, it's a matter of talking to people. Other resources include the internship office on campus, um, the alumni office, which might be straight through the internship office as well, but saying, hey, where do Brie Lockwoods work? Are there any in the area of X? And actually, we just had a computer science grad visit back recently who does a lot of systems type work. So in terms of systems administration, he started off in that area and then moved into maintaining large complex build systems, which I think I said in class one day, if you want a job for life, 
develop a loan for make. Um, <clears throat> so I've said all of this. Identify businesses you might want to intern with. And that could also be like, hey, I like product X. I like social mission Y. What kinds of businesses work in that space? Um, broaden your horizons. So also don't limit your experiences. I remember a student um, who was lacked a lot of confidence even through her senior year. And when she went off and got her job, she came back and visited us about a year, year and a half later, and then was thriving and excited. And said, and I said, you know, so what happened? It's like, well, the real world, you know, real world. <laughs> right? It was like the real world, the working world is different than school. I have this team, I'm like the youngest person on my team, everyone else are these 50, 60 year old guys. And they made me like, but they're incredible and they're an incredible group of people to work with, and I've learned so much. And the pay, it's not as hectic. Right? If you think about what college is like, you're in four different four, four, right? Like none of the courses have anything to do with each other. Sometimes they do, right? But you know, like you can have what mythology, computer science. That's what I helped. It was always Spanish, math, and HHP. Yeah, right. It's just pretend your context switch all day long, and then somebody says now. Tell us what you know, but more so tell us that you know how to think like somebody who studies mythology. And you're, oh, right. Well, that's actually job. A job isn't quite like that. You tend to work on one thing. I mean, so you might work on multiple things, but it's not like okay for 15 minutes, do this now, do this now. Okay, back to the first thing. No. Um, although I think that's more like what being a professor is. It's crazy. Man. So, um, I just switched it as all day long. Anyway, um, so consider the, the things you enjoy doing and what other spaces you might find that. So it's easy to say, hey, I'm interested in game development. But what about that do you believe you're going to enjoy? And find other opportunities that you think include that. And leverage your strengths. Um, this is not networking. For all I know, I don't know, I killed my Facebook page. I felt it was a professional liability. Um, I had friends from college on my Facebook page. I could be bad. Uh, but this isn't networking. Networking is people you know directly. Networking is uh, through parents and others. It's through your faculty. It's through labor supervisors and colleagues at the college and alumni. So you know how do you how do you meet alumni who have the knowledge of other things? Probably through your faculty. Uh, I just have a copy in my Facebook. Uh try to give you a Facebook profile, try to make it like keep it as professional as possible because when you apply um internship or whatever job, they actually look inside. Like check your Facebook. They actually can go and Google. Like Google it and whatever comes out, they just look for. So if you can just go and Google it and then see what, uh, what shows up there, yeah, that's you. So I've been heard tips like when you do that, if you really want to keep your Facebook still, and then what you do is like you just deactivate it for a while and then. You can play whatever games you want with your Facebook. Uh, I think the difficult thing is your Facebook is a space that other people can post and say things. That you have little control over. Uh, and now that I, feel, I believe, I don't know. I don't know. Someday I need to learn. If you pay for searches against Facebook's database, then good things you do. Yeah, probably. Right? Because I'm sure people have to play, actually delete anything. Yeah, they right. Don't have to delete right. And, and Facebook, you are not Facebook's customers, you are Facebook's product. So, uh, so yeah. So networking is a people thing, and you guys can all do that. Um, what what Snowy was talking about here is moving towards portfolio and presence. So think about what you're applying, want to apply to, and develop a portfolio for that work. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about a portfolio in a minute. Um, to give you a sense, 
when I start after basically my first year of graduate, I really <coughs> fell in love with teaching and decided that I wanted to aim to be college faculty, in particular a small school. Here we are. Um, I started a web blog around 98, 99. And I didn't post to it often. And I never posted anything crazy. I tried to generally write reasonable things. Now, it wasn't that I was misrepresenting myself. It wasn't that I was being someone other than me. Like I talk about my new racquetball racket and how excited I got. But I didn't do that 30 times a day. And I didn't do it for two years. Um, during the war in Iraq, I did not rant against the administration, but I did rant about news media. Because I really didn't like the way the free press was handling the war. Um, point being, though, is I knew that when it came time for me to apply for jobs, people would look for who I was online. I wanted them to find things I wanted them to find. So you can curate your online presence. Part of that you know, so that idea of keeping things professional, clean, and simple. Uh, tools that are useful to you, I think, and that are freely available to you. LinkedIn is a really nice place to do that. It's, it's a social media feed that is explicitly about jobs. And you can set up a simple profile page that includes education and opportunities. And um, I can't come along and post pictures of cat or Something to say, oh, you said this really stupid thing yesterday in class. Ha, ha, ha. Like, that's Facebook. LinkedIn is your page. And it really is designed as a professional social networking site. So it's easy to create a, a, a free profile there and make use of it. WordPress, you can get a free web blog if you want. Uh, and that's tied into the notion of a portfolio. Twitter is relatively harmless, I think. Um, and also, if you're in computing, starting to think about maybe taking an independent project that you did. So if you did, and it doesn't have to be big. So if you do something and say data structures as part of a project where you did develop something of your own, make it a piece of free and open software after the project is done on GitHub. Clean it up a little bit, add some comments. Love something. You just look a little bit, trying to read picture because it's like skeptical. No? Oh, okay. Um, and I don't recommend you do it before. But only for the reason that if you do it before and then someone else borrows the code and submits it, it and then, you're, then it's up to how good were they obfuscating it. They're probably not. So <laughs> then you'll be having a conversation with one of the faculty about why does this person go look just like yours? So maybe bring it on and have to be some uh, But all of that, and I'm not too worried about that. Uh, but my point being is that there are companies that as part of application, you know, they say, hey, we'd like to see evidence of the code you bring. Can you send us a link to your GitHub site? And, and or have you ever done work on an open source project? Uh, interestingly enough, Microsoft now looks and says, have you done any, ever made any contributions to free and open software? Because to work in a distributed team of software developers on a piece of complex software is exactly the kind of skill they're trying to recruit for. So successful contribution to open source projects, which the entire barrier to entry is to try, to just plan. And when I say contributions, it can be a lot of things. Think about the Firefox project. Does everybody think about Firefox code? There's documentation in 37 languages. Does that documentation ever go out of date? Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> every release. Right? <laughs> and so you can, you, know, you can start by contributing to documentation. You could say, I'm going to look at what the bugs are. Maybe I'll try and reproduce a bug and post that back to a bug thread on the bug tracker and say, I was able to verify this on the bug. Right? Finding ways to engage productively if you're interested in that kind of thing is useful. And so when I talk about a portfolio of work, I'm really saying maybe having a website that has two or three pages. Something about me, a place to post a resume, a place to have links to something like a GitHub. It doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be fancy. But it's a nice thing to be able to put on a business card and include at the bottom of an email when you're applying for internships and jobs. 
That doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't cost anything. You can get help from each other, from us, right? And it puts you a bar above all the people who don't do that. Um, if we go all the way back, how many of you have read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Not enough of you. Right? And if, well, in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy are intrepid, accidental hero who never really saves anything. So, almost an anti hero in the classical sense. Um, this hitchhiking around the galaxy, if you have your towel but nothing else, then apparently the culture of the universe is that it is assumed if you know where your towel is that you probably have just accidentally misplaced any of three dozen different things you might need. So if you ask for a toothbrush, someone will gladly give it to you because you are so cool for knowing where your towel is. And I'm claiming that a small portfolio <clears throat> is part of that demonstration of professional awareness that's easy to do. And most, I think a lot of students don't do it. Um, as you're looking at labor, and this one's, this one's a tough one. Um, in some ways, but think about labor opportunities. It's easy sometimes to stay in a labor position, not move to something else. Um, but at the same time, think about the kind of things you want to do. What kind of connections are you cultivating? What kind of letters of recommendation can you get as a result of those positions? Um, basically, are there ways you can use the labor program to your advantage as a student? Um, so don't don't be afraid to switch positions. Something that I have not looked into and I don't want to have a discussion of right now, part of because I'm recording and in this detail. But I think something that's really difficult, at least from my perspective, is if you are making financial decisions based on labor wages between a grade two and a grade three. Because I don't think it's a big price, a big pay term. But if you have an opportunity, and I don't know what kind of jobs will look great, I'm not sure either. But the question is, do you take a job that pays slightly more, or do you take a job that pays slightly less, but potentially puts you in a good position to either explore something good for longer term? Right? If you're talking about a $40 difference per semester, what is that $40 worth long term as an investment? You say, ooh, I could do an internship with, uh, sorry, a labor position with uh, like maybe Professor Hacker. I could be his TA. Could being the TA with the lead of the entrepreneurship program be a good connection, a good networking opportunity? Would you trade one pay grade for that opportunity? I don't know. But that's the calculation I'm asking you to think about a little bit um, as you look at labor positions in that. Whether you do or don't, but that it is, a, it is a source of networking. You know, it's very different both than most other institutions. Um, <clears throat> this is part of the presentation that I love personal investment in. Um, I, well, I, I was trying to find things about letters of recommendation. I found this comic, which is not really at all related. It's actually about the pointy-haired boss threatening to fire Alice, which happens often in Dilbert. She doesn't ever get fired, so it's okay. Uh, you know, he says, I promise that if you quit on me, I'll give you a bad job reference, and you, you will never <coughs> again. And how is that as good as a race? What if it's used in my position? Uh, but with start with letters of rock, please start early. Uh, please. Please. At least one of you will come to myself or one of my colleagues about three days before one is due because you discovered the opportunity late and you really want to apply. We quite possibly will oblige you. It's easier if we've already written a letter for you. If it's a fresh new letter because you've never spoken to us before, we might say no. It depends on what's going on in our lives. And I I have to have teeth pulled tomorrow. I don't know when I'm going to be able to write your letter. You're like, that could happen. Uh, but by March, we are accommodating. But it's really awesome you say, I'm applying for an internship. And uh, if letters of reference would be due in two months, would you be willing to write one? Yes. Um, when will I write it? Two days before it's due. But it'll be on me. It'll be on me. And we probably would have talked about it. We'll have time to actually get together. It'll be good. 
Uh, and I do personally, and I would use that recommendations policy with any and all faculty on campus. It's some general guidelines. Uh, things like uh, have a copy of your resume and copy of the description of what you're trying to do, talk to us in advance, follow up. All right, so even if you talk to me three weeks before it's due, check in a week and a half later. And check in five days before it's due. And then check in a day or two before it's due. I will speak for my colleagues, and if I you ever discover a professor who dislikes this, tell me. But once you've asked me to write a letter of reference for you for something, you are now, excuse me, empowered to pester me. Professor Jaden, have you met me? That, that letter of reference that's due at the end of the week, have you done it? <laughs> no, I'll do that tonight, two days later. Matt, you, you, did the letter go out? I started it. <laughs> it it'll go out. It'll go out. <laughs> the day it's due, little email goes, you know, like, is the letter going out yet? I'm working on it right now. Like, sometimes it does get close to the end. That does not mean that I put no time into letters, but it means that the letter is often interspersed with everything else. And so you should stay on top of recommenders. Um, I feel awful about it. I once failed to submit a letter for something that because there were supposed to be a certain number of letters attached to the application, it automatically failed to go through to the next round because of the letter. It was doing five. Uh, it was doing something like five o'clock. No, it was due at 8 o'clock, but in a different time zone, which made it 5 o'clock my time. And I assumed it would be due by midnight. And it, it involved the NSF. The NSF does not care. So I broke and said, I'm really sorry, can I can't come up with this still. They, said, they probably copied and pasted or had a generic response. It's too bad for me. Did I ever get any follow-up, like in the days preceding? No. Did I get a check in, like, and the student was able to check the status of the letters? So, yes, when I offer to write a letter, or when I say I'll write a letter, it's my responsibility, but it's still your responsibility. We're a team at that point. Don't let me let you down. Um, that's sort of it for internships, with that covers a bunch of things. I'm going to probably go over more briefly through some of what follows. Um, any questions about any of that before I go any further? Um, this is an actual picture of me in grad school. That? Does that guy look more like me? If the, uh, the hair is more like <clears throat> Does that woman look more like me? <laughs> okay, well, you know, that's all right. Well, it's good. I don't know. So that's from like 98. Um, so I'll briefly go through grad school because um, of at least the group that I was talking to before, none of you are about to be applying to grad school. Um, and so just briefly, you want to think about what kind of degree you want. Uh, master's is two years. PhD is a lifetime. Um, <laughs> by and large, if you are interested in graduate work, you should be able to find funded programs in computing or related wow. technologies um, that you know, will often involve either research or teaching or something like that. Um, my suspicion is, is that as Berea students going on to grad school, the workload that you will experience is probably less in many ways, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty common to carry a three-course load as a graduate student and then be a TA in a course or two. It's not been compared to four courses in a labor position. Yeah. Uh, and then for funded programs, uh, another way you can do or to get it over this is to come back and come back and you mm -hmm. take away your own position. But then the other two things probably the one you can test to is this. Yeah, we are, uh, at times they just give you the I had a student who got uh, a job at Boeing, 
and got into their accelerated management program. So they paid for an MBA at Harvard, and they rotated her through the six divisions of the company over the course of two years. And paid the degree. And I think she had to work there for another two years or something. Like it's often that also that they, you are contractually obligated to stay, so you don't have to pay for the degree for at least a year or two afterwards. Because they're not in the business of giving away degrees so you can go get a job somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. um, but there are large companies will do that. And so that's, that's, you will not tip, it will sometimes they'll pay for coursework towards a PhD, but more often you'll find they'll support a master's. Um, when you're looking at grad school, start in the fall, um, because apps go out in the fall. So you really might want to start the semester before or summer leading up to your senior year. But you've got time. Work with your faculty. Turns out we know what grad school is like. Um, if you're looking to apply, apply for jobs, and, and most of them is not, but see internships. I think a lot of that for jobs, uh, it's a lot of what we've talked about internships, applies for jobs as well. Um, I will just say that as you're doing that or any of these applications, please involve faculty or somebody in the internship office early. Uh, I sometimes have students come in and say, I applied, I've applied for 20 things and nothing's worked. Look, I see you better. What are you using for a cover letter? And I get this thing that says, that's sort of like the same sentence over and over with a slightly different verb or something. And I say, you know, we can do better than this. Like we can improve something about it. So involve us early in your application process so we can help you produce the best applications possible. Uh, likewise with your resume. Again, those are services that the insurance office does a great job with. Um, Briefly about summer research, if you're interested um, in summer research, it's good preparation for grad school. Uh, opportunities could include work here at Berea, the faculty. I know it's surprising, but it happens. Um, REUs, research experiences for undergraduates, I'll say a bit more about that. Industry labs like IBM, Microsoft, and others. Two approaches to that, your own project, where you say, I want to do this. Uh, and a faculty project, where the faculty member says, I want to do this. Uh, this is a picture from an autonomous aircraft project that I did a few years back. In terms of your own project, I would suggest, and again, start a conversation with faculty early, but during the fall is a good time to be doing background research and identifying like what kind of things you want to do, uh, starting to explore a little bit. Maybe in the spring, do a half credit or full credit independent study to actually start doing work on the, the, the project so you don't get the summer cold. And in the summer, then, go. Go as fast and hard as you can. Um, this is me at Red Hat hacking away on, on a project. Um, <clears throat> if you're working with faculty on a project, you can probably start in the spring and see about doing an independent study, which you do on a spare time. I'm starting to think it'd be cool to do a little, like some small independent <laughs> study leading up to summer research, so that way the summer is not a cold start. Um, so it's sort of the same story. And when we did our work, we published. Um, we got to write up our work and present it. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, by a lot of fun, I mean we drove to a conference on Friday and drove back on Saturday. Um, uh, but we had a bunch of natural along with that. It's fun. Uh, and this is actually a colleague, Mark Goodrich. Uh, he is not the short one. Um, he's on the left. He is at Hendricks College. And uh, that's Catherine. And we did a robotics project involving little autonomous firefighting robots and then some genetic algorithms work to see if we can make our robot figure out how to solve things better than we could program. The answer was maybe slightly. Uh, it was really cool. And uh, that was at the conference where we presented our work. Uh, it's in Philadelphia, so that's the Liberty Bell to see it. Research experiences for undergraduates. It's a big NSF program. Faculty apply. The NSF gives them money. They create spots for eight or ten undergraduate researchers. Those researchers come to their school and do projects for the summer. Um, you can find REUs at probably, I don't know if EKU has any, UK probably has any, Louisville has any, lots of schools all over the country have it. Sometimes you have restrictions on nationality. Not always. It depends on the sources of funding they have available. Um, 
because it's NSF money, money, sometimes they say, even if you represent 50% of all Zimbabwe wins at Berea, there are some RUs that they say that you can't be money. However, there are plenty of them that don't have those restrictions. So um, that's a really nice program to look for. Um, think about where you want to go and what you want to do. If you're interested in computational physics, um, I think there's some really cool stuff going on out in Boulder and Denver because the uh, I think the National uh, Atmospheric Research Center is somewhere right around there, so they've got a cluster to a new lot of physics. And hey, Boulder, Colorado is right at the base of the Rockies and it's gorgeous. So if you're looking at these kind of programs, do not say, oh, like, okay, we'll talk about that more. But, uh, think about where you want to go. It's a chance to go somewhere and do stuff. And they often have things on the weekend for all the students doing research on the summer. So if you're on a big campus with lots of research going on, there's going to be a lot of people doing cool stuff. And big schools are sort of on all year round. Whereas little schools like Berea, it's sort of like they shut off. Right? Louisville does not shut off. UC Boulder does not shut off. And also, if you're thinking of grad school, you could be working with somebody who then you might go back for a master's or a PhD with and open some doors for yourself. This picture has nothing to do with anything. Uh, but it is me. That those are my hands. Uh, and that actually is an Arduino made out of cardboard. So your biggest challenges. I think some of your biggest challenges, and this applies to just about everything, confidence. Um, some of you are in COP board where we talked a little bit about stereotype threat, but really, like, are you better, a better candidate than, say, a student from Princeton? Thank you. <laughs> Please look at this gentleman over here. Do that again. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Practice saying, right, so look, are you a better candidate for a summer internship or research experience than a candidate from Princeton? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Are you computer science? Yes. All right. It really is a matter of just saying, you know what? It doesn't matter. Like, who is a good school? You guys should get excellent education. And so what do you do? I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but I want to be close to my family. I know it's hard. Yeah, so close. Think about our, our friends and colleagues here who are not close to their family, who aren't even in the same time zone by a long stretch. And uh, you know, so this these are these are opportunities to get out, right? So we think of study abroad as a chance to get out, but actually summer internships, summer research, these are a cool opportunity to go somewhere. Um, motivation. Um, getting on top of it when you're buried in other work. I don't give you that much homework. <laughs> so, you know, making that time, finding the motivation to say, I'm going to look for some of these internship opportunities. I'm going to do another application. I'm going to meet with the professor and talk about this work. Um, confidence, motivation, confidence, right? But confidence is a big one. If you shoot yourself down before someone else gets a chance to shoot you down, it's a lot less fun for them. Um, it's hard. I mean, this stuff is hard. You put yourself out there, and it does take it takes some confidence, and it. If you apply for something that you really want and you don't get it, it hurts. So what? Try again. Come back and talk to your, your mentor, whether it's in labor or on the academic side or whatever, and say, all right, I didn't get the one I wanted. What do I do next? Actually, you should be applying for more than one thing before you find out. Uh, you wait until you find out. We're now into March, and it's no good. So you should be applying for multiple things, and you're going to have to wait, and that's no fun either. Uh, this is a picture from a project that was students on 3D printing to produce images of data structures from computing for blind students. That was kind of a project. Um, 
So the conclusion, yeah, I can use my own. Um, start early, do your homework, right? Um, at some level, this is not entirely true. This is why I'm doing the presentation, but doing a generic meeting and saying, hey, I think I'm interested in internships, what should I do? Well, now you know. So you've taken this first step. You don't need to ask to meet with somebody. Um, you can now start doing some research and now say, hey, who can I meet with in the department to talk about research experiences? Scott actually has some nice connections through where he went to school previously to some summer research programs that are pretty big. So that would be a good place to start, or with any of the faculty. Um, but do some research first. Say, hey, I think you know, I found these four things. I think this is the space I'm interested in. What else? Um, ask for letters early. Ask questions. Ask us hard questions. Be confident and be bold. Aim high. It's not going to cost you anything other than a little bit of time. Applications are electronic now. You don't even have to pay postage. So it's just aim as high and as far as you want. And let's do the best, you know, put together the best application that we can. What's the absolute worst thing that could happen? You could find yourself applying for some of labor and do something here on campus. What's the worst case? Uh, Worse, I mean, like, you're not going to be destitute. You're not going to have nothing to do. Right? There's, like, your worst case is better than a lot of people's worst cases, is what I'm saying. So, you know, let's do something cool. Get out there and try something new. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, I can, if you want, I can talk for another 45 minutes, but I don't want to. Um, but I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Um, and so uh, I'll make the slides available and the video will be available as well so if you know somebody would like to listen to it. Um, but you know the slides and the video will be there. So questions. When you're writing letters of recommendation, do you write a general letter about the student? A specific to that application? I I well I once I've written one, I have some reusable material. But that's not once I've written one for you, I have material for him. Well, right. So once I've written a letter for you, I will tailor every letter to make sure it speaks to the application. Um, and sometimes I have to write a completely different letter. Depends. So if it's for REUs, once I've crafted a letter that I think is excellent, the things I'm speaking to for a research internship are different than for, say, development. So if you apply to three or four REUs, I'm going to use essentially the same letter. Um, but that's, I'll make sure that they, they're not different in some way. But really, like, I know I'm speaking to a faculty member who wants to do kind of student group research. And that letter is going to be the same for all of those faculty, save for some details. Um, but no, there's no rubber stamp. <laughs> My letters are all there. Like, no, it takes time. I think that would be, I'm, and I'm pretty sure that, that would be true for all the problems. If you look at every letter, every letter for every student, make sure that what we're sending is the best possible letter. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I'll be here every Saturday. And, uh, um, I'll be honest with that. Um, so thank you all. And my hope is that myself or others in the department will hear from you soon. That we'll have done some research, found some opportunities, and we'll start thinking about how we're going to do what we want to do. I'm done.